wonderful your care and your provision for the helpless your grace when we were dead in our transgressions oh jesus by your blood we have been saved beautiful your sacrifice for those so undeserving Pursuing us with faithfulness unswerving Oh, what can separate us from our God Can keep us from our God It is finished, it is finished indeed Come and lay your burdens down at your Savior's feet Alleluia, Lord, your work is complete your finished work upon the cross into the grave our savior's body bloody scorched and broken our loving father's rescue plan in motion he rose again oh death where is your sting now death where is your sting he is risen stands victorious and we have been redeemed hallelujah lord your work is complete your finished work upon the cross oh your perfect love was shown upon the cross oh your perfect love was shown upon the Your perfect love was shown upon the cross. It is finished, it is finished indeed. Oh, your work is complete. Lord, your work is complete. Your work is complete. Good morning. Welcome to Trinity. We're so glad to have you worshiping with us today. As we do each and every week, we begin our service with a call to worship God's word, calling us into his presence. And this morning's call to worship is drawn from Isaiah chapter 42, and it speaks long before the birth of Christ to the character of of Jesus and the hope that is ours because of the work of Jesus on our behalf. And so if you are willing and able, I invite you now to please stand and read responsively with me our call to worship. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. Let all people sing for joy and give glory to the Lord. Let us lift up our voices now together in our song of adoration. Oh, 
worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of His might, oh, sing of His grace, whose robe is the light and canopy space. His chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, dark is His on the wings of the storm. You alone are the matchless King. To you alone be all majesty. Your glories and wonders what tongue can recite. You breathe in the air, shine in the light. Oh, measureless, mighty, ineffable love, while angels delight. How tender, how firm to the end A maker, defender, redeemer, and friend You alone are the matchless King To you alone be all majesty Your glories and wonders what tongue can recite You breathe in the air sing his wonderful love our shield and defender the ancient of days pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise let's join our hearts together in prayer and so now our father holy one of israel you are all wise all powerful and all good and yet you delight for us to come into your presence, sin-stained though we are. We thank you that in Jesus Christ you have adorned us with his righteousness. You have brought us near with rejoicing. You call us daughters and sons. You've sealed this adoption by your spirit. And now you feed us by word and sacrament. So give us Jesus by faith. Today we pray, give us more of his beauty, more of his loveliness, Help us to see and behold all that he has done to pursue us, to win us, now to keep and preserve us. Show us, Holy Spirit, our great need for this beautiful one, Jesus. Lead us into conformity to his image by your power. Keep us strong and faithful by your grace. Lead us through this worship service for the glory of the Father, through the work of the Son, by the power of the Spirit. We pray all these things through Christ, our Savior. Amen. If you're anything like me, you struggle to believe some of these things that we say are true. You struggle to be like, what's the meaning of this? Or how does this have any import in my life? Part of the reason that we recite these creeds every week is that we can be reminded that they are true independent of our grasp of them, independent on how well we're doing spiritually. They're still true. And we remind each other of that, no matter how weak, how feeble our faith. Let me ask you, friends, what do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, 
And the third day He rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. And He shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and Giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. As we come to our confession of sin, I'd like to consider a statement in Romans 1 briefly. It says that we suppress the truth for a lie. Now, notice that we're neither passive in this nor are we just, uh, nor are we just um, uh, self-deceived. Self Our hearts are active and deceitful in this in that we do suppress the truth for a lie. By intentionally confessing our sin corporately into one another, we help each other to see our blind spots and the patterns of our deceitful hearts. Recently, my wife Deborah has been showing me some of my blind spots that if it weren't for her, I wouldn't see on my own. And what this helped do is identify some of the heart issues that I had that were bringing out manifold sins of anger, self-righteousness, and self-pity. And getting to the heart issue was essential. But yet, it didn't take a one and done, here's your sin, now go and fix it type thing. It took a repeated confession of the sin and heart uh, examination. So, one of the fruits we get out of confessing our sins openly, honestly, and repeatedly is to grow in our repentance and faith and our humility. So, with that, if you would, turn with me to page 7 and let's confess our sins together. Father, forgive us for forsaking you, the fountain of living waters. We have made for ourselves broken cisterns that hold no water. Have mercy on us when we love with limits, care with conditions, and extend hospitality with expectations in return. Your word says that if we love you, we will keep your commands. Yet our sin shows our contempt of your rule in our hearts. By your Holy Spirit, help us to love others as you have loved us. Please create in each of us a heart that is drawn to the cross of Christ, not only for our forgiveness, but also for our righteousness. Now go ahead and take a minute to um, pray to God silently about your own sins and confession. Father, forgive us, cleanse us from our sin, and restore us in the righteousness of your Son. Bring us to a godly repentance that grows our faith and humbles us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, if you're able and willing, please stand and hear these words of grace from Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, 
and kings to the brightness of your rising. This is good news of inexpressible joy. Let's now sing songs of praise to the one who is worthy. Jesus, friend of sinners, love me ere I knew him. Drew me with his cords of love, tightly bound me to him. Around my heart still closely twined, the ties that none can sever. That leaves no question of the measure of his love. Our chains are gone, our debt is paid, the cross is overthrown, the grave for Jesus' blood. That sets us free means death to death and life for me. The innocent judge guilty, the guilty one was free. Death would be his portion.
by the Lamb who was slain. I'm forgiven, the sinner's Savior. Crown him forever for the Lamb who was slain. He is risen. I give my whole life to honor this love by the Lamb who was slain. I'm forgiven, the sinner's Savior. seated. Good morning. It is so wonderful to be worshiping with you this morning. That We are entering our time of offering. This is a time in which we give back a little out of the abundance that God has given to us. If you're a visitor with us this morning, please feel no obligation to give. This is for those who are involved in the life and work at Trinity. If you do have an offering to give today, there are two boxes in the back of the room, and then you can also give online. If you are a visitor with us today, we wholeheartedly welcome you. Thank you for coming this morning. We have a page in the bulletin on page 18 for visitors. There's a QR code on there. So if you would like to have someone reach out to you from the church to answer any of your questions, to meet with you, please go ahead and scan that QR code. Give us your email address, and we'll have someone reach out to you. If you are, have been coming to Trinity but are not yet connected to a community group, I encourage you to reach out to Jenny Wernley to help you get connected with a group. Her information is on the back of the bulletin. These community groups are groups that are made up of church members that get together every week to do Bible study, pray together, have meals together, just support one another. And so we would love to have every member, every person involved in Trinity to be involved in a community group. So reach out to Jenny if you have not done so. If you are not receiving emails from Trinity, but you think you should be, we encourage you to check your spam folder. It's possible that our emails are in there. Um, however, if they're not in there, or if you are wanting to receive emails and are not yet doing so, you can also scan that QR code in the bulletin on page 18. Give us your email, and we'll make sure to add you to our email list. Today is our second to fourth grade meetup, baking and board games. It'll be at the Hasty Home today from 2 to 4 o'clock. If you are a parent who is interested in bringing your second to fourth grader to this event but have not had a chance to register, please email me, Rebecca Hasty. My email is also on the back of the bulletin. Um, and let me know by the end of this service so that I can make sure we have space for everyone. If you look at page 14 of the bulletin, you'll see a couple other really cool things that are happening in the life of the church. On November 20th, from 9.30 to 11 a.m., we have a prayer and building tour. So we'll do a prayer walk around Ghent, followed by a building tour of our new building on 1600 Colonial Avenue. So we encourage you to come out and join us for that. Also on that page, you'll see that the Entrusted Conference is next weekend. This is an organization that supports foster and adoption communities within Hampton Roads, and it's a mixture of a whole bunch of churches and organizations. So if you're interested in attending the conference, you can register. The information is also on page 14 in the bulletin. November is our month that we make recommendations for deacons' assistance. So we encourage you in this next week to be praying for anyone that you might want to suggest, any names that you could suggest for those who could be nominated for deacons' assistance. Also in November, this is the month that we have our deacons' offering, our deacons' fund offering. 
We'll be gathering the, the offering on November 14th and 21st. That's next week and the week after that. And this offering is one of two extra special offerings we have every year. It's a time that the Deacons Fund offering um, provides practical assistance in day-to-day -day needs for members within our congregation and friends of the church. And so uh, my own family has benefited from the Deacons Fund in the past, and it was a huge blessing at that time for us. And I know that there are other members within our church who have had needs of financial needs or needs to support us while we've been needing counseling, things like that. The Deacons Fund helps with that. And so if you will pray over the next week, think about ways that you can give for the Deacons Fund offering, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Well, each week we use the Psalms to guide our prayers. And this week we're using Psalm 95. Excerpts of that Psalm are on page 10 of your bulletin. So let us join our hearts together as I pray for us. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great, great King above all gods. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, You are worthy of all praise and glory. Now fill us with your Holy Spirit as we sing songs and make melody to the Lord with our hearts, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We lift the Hokemans to you and ask your continued blessing on Keith and Lori's ministry of support to the missions in Southwest Asia. We pray for the missionaries who remain there for Holy Spirit power in bringing your gospel into the homes and, and their hearts. Protect them and keep them from COVID and persecution. We pray for those missionaries who had to leave Southwest Asia and desire to return. Give them patience as you open doors and willing hearts to receive them. We pray for those who are not yet believers that they would hear and respond to your gospel. We pray for your hand upon those serving in the pop-up church as they transition from serving at the temporary shelter to the long-term shelter at the center. Encourage their hearts with your love and their tongues with your sweet grace to speak hope to the homeless as they build relationships in this new location. We pray for our church specifically and for all of Christ's church around the world that you would open the hearts of God's people to believe your gospel more fully and walk in the good works you have prepared for us beforehand. Help us to live, love, and serve as the body of Christ that would bring light into a lost and dying world. For we do not advance your kingdom as Lone Ranger Christians, but as one body who celebrate our adoption into your church family. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Mirabah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. Father, help us to encourage one another daily that we would not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Shape our hearts to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. Move us to help the helpless and harassed, to fight those who can't fight for themselves, and fight to change laws and systems that strip dignity of your image bearers. We pray you would surround the families of the three women murdered in Young Terrace on Wednesday night, Dietra Brown, Nicole Lovewine, and Sarah Constein, with your presence and comfort as they mourn the loss of their loved ones. We pray also for a quick and full recovery of the two women who were injured in this senseless violence. Shower the love of Christ over Young Terrace and help them to grieve with hope amidst this present darkness, wrapping your loving arms around this hurting community and protect them. Bring them tangible gifts of love and healing through your people by prayers and deeds. We pray also for Kathy and Jim Nelson's granddaughter, Charlotte, who was just born early, and her mom with a high-risk pregnancy. We pray to you would protect them both and continue healing them. We lift our high school seniors who are returning from their retreat today. 
We pray their hearts are anchored more deeply in the joy of your great salvation, and they return refreshed. Now, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, help us to be shocked and amazed by your grace anew. May your spirit rest upon Jack as he preaches your word today. And let today be the day that your word wakes our numb consciences and moves us afresh with the hope and love of your beautiful son. This is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're between the ages of three and first grade, now's the time that we dismiss for a training in the pews. Children's worship alternative, we'd be happy to offer you or your families during this time. Glad that you're here. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thanks for joining us online or here in person. So we are nearing the end of our sermon series in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Uh, there's this week and next week left, next, and uh, one filler week, and then Advent, if you can believe that. Pretty exciting. What we're doing this morning is we're continuing where we left off last week. Remember, last week, Paul's talking about this great mystery of the church, how he's building this new type of thing, this new society that isn't based on ethnicity, it's not based on homogeneity, it's based on uniting Jew and Gentile and creating this very different organism called the church. And he picks up that story today in verses 7 through 13, and he's asking you and I, you and me, excuse me, what is your view of the church? What do you think about the church? How does the church figure into your life week to week? To what extent would you say the church matters? I mean matters, matters, as you see it in your spending or your decisions or your free time, your relationships. As you think about those questions, and I'm not asking them rhetorically. I'm not trying to guilt you in anything. I'm asking you, what do you really think? As you think about those, let me read these verses to you, and we'll see what Paul might think about the church. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory, the word of the Lord. So this is God's word. It's without error in any part. It's for his glory. It's for our good. I, um, I inhabited this, this space when I was in high school that I like to call redneck chic. It was kind of just moderately preppy, but also kind of haute redneck, as it were. And I got to tell you, it fit pretty well in Stafford County. I mean, it, it really ran well. So in Stafford County in the 80s, it wasn't enough just to have stone washed everything. We had to have it acid washed. So we acid washed, stone washed jeans and jean jackets. We got the bomber jackets with the white t-shirt underneath it. You know, big, big sweaters, rugby shirts without seams anywhere, you know, so that wouldn't rip when we're out on the rugby pitch, of course. But we had, you know, really white shoes, tennis shoes, and, you know, it was a hip, hip time fashion in the 80s. And I thought in kind of Stafford County with all that flannel and all that denim, that was going to communicate well where I went to college. This is going to surprise you, but it didn't. Because Stafford County wasn't, isn't the center of kind of American youth fashion, Surprising, and I went to school, and it took about a week to realize just how differently I was dressing from everybody on campus, and I mean everybody on campus. And I was calling my parents, like, "You got to ship something. 
You've got to send some SOS clothing because what I thought was this redneck chic, this kind of hip preppy thing, just didn't work there. And that was a shock to the system because I was inhabiting this ecosystem where everything that I thought was normal and cool wasn't anymore. Now, I want you to think about the waters in which you swim. You know, the, tra- the currents in which you're trafficking. Because they're telling you something. They have messages for you about what's normal, what's cool, what's expected. And we don't really ever think about that unless we're taken out of that system. Last week, we talked a lot about the centrality of the church. This week, I want to talk about how the centrality of the church combats our individualism. And that's something we don't think a lot about because it's like, of course, we're individualistic. We're Americans. And we inhabit the West. And you know, this is how we've been thinking for 700 years in our culture, in our society. And the Bible has something really different to say about our individualism. And specifically, how the church combats that individualism. So I want us to think about how the centrality of the church kind of makes us take a step back about how we normally think about ourselves and our time and our spending and our habits and our priorities. And I want to do that conveniently in three ways this morning. I want to talk about how this church is combating our individualism as it reveals the calling of the church, the focus of the church, and then the power of the church. The calling of the church, the focus of the church, the power of the church, and how all three of those, they point their finger directly at our individualism and say, hang on, hang on. The way you've been living and everyone else around you is living may not be the healthiest way to live. Let's look at those in turn. First, where do you see this calling of the church? I think it's bookended, frankly, in our text. First, verse 7 of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. This is the Apostle Paul in prison. He has done incredible things already for the church and its growth among all the Gentiles and nations. And he says, the only reason, the only reason I'm a Christian, I'm a minister, is God's grace. And the only reason I'm at all effective is because of his power at work in me. What's he saying? is that our calling as a church is to live lives of dependency. It's all by grace, he says. It's all through his spirit, he says. And then we say, now wait a second, what does that do to my individual agency and power and ability? And he's saying to us, if you think you're going to do this Christian life by your power, your abilities, your own wisdom, your sense of what's what, the smorgasbord that you've created, a little bit of culture and a little bit of your family of origin, a little bit of Jesus, and you mix them all together. He's saying, well, you've moved away from grace. And if you think you can kind of fight sin and try to live a good life, you want to forgive people, help the poor, serve the needy, and you want to do that on your terms by your power, he's saying, well, it actually all comes through the Spirit. And he's asking us, why are you so independent when I'm inviting you to dependency? Why are you living like it's up to you when it's all by grace? Why are you living like you have to fix it and change and control them? And we overplay our agency, don't we? Because we overestimate our ability, don't we? And he's saying, come on, take a breath, take a breath. It's grace. It's his work. You're his sheep his children. But it's not just that he calls us to a life of dependency. He calls us to a life of sacrifice. Verse 7 says it's by grace. Look at verse 13 at the end. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Now remember, literally, he's in prison. And he's suffering for them because he says, I really believe the gospel's got to go to the nations. I believe the gospel has to go to the Gentiles. It isn't just this homogenous church. It's not monocultural. It's not monoethnic. Remember, he's saying we're doing this whole new thing. It's not law-based. It's not temple-based. It's not nation-state-based. We're going to do a church that's transnational, that's pan-ethnic, 
that's multiracial. Where the Holy Spirit doesn't reside in one place, but now within all of us. But notice, notice as he does that, notice the price. He's imprisoned. He's suffering for their sake, which he says is to their glory. Guess what's the formula there? It's not just that we're called to a life of dependency, but this life of sacrifice that always, inevitably, looks like suffering. If you want to be used by God at all, it's going to cost you. If you want to serve anyone at all, the poor, the hurting, the immigrant, your neighbor, your family, let alone the church, it's costly, isn't it? And we want to shortcut that. We want to be like, oh, I want to serve, I want to be used, but I don't want it to be painful or inconvenient, and I don't want it to get in the way with my priorities, and it certainly can't affect my spending or my time. He's like, huh, okay, how's that working out? Because any one of you that has grown at all as a Christian, you've grown because somebody else paid a price. They got up early, spent a lot of time with you on the phone, they studied for your retreat, they spent time with you when you were a kid, they watched your children in nursery, they served in tips, they plowed through adolescent Sunday school, any of those means in the ordinary ways, let alone just that friend that's walking through you in your grief and your heartache, it's costing them something. Suffering brings glory. And if you want glory, if you want new life, you gotta give your life away, he's saying. You gotta serve. You gotta care. And America, our culture is like, care about yourself. Serve yourself. Make sure you're happy, you're protected, you're safe, you're convenienced. And do all of those things. If you feel there's some margin at the end, a margin later, okay, then fine. But before that, uh uh-uh, it's about you. And I want you to think about how that's cost in the church. If you don't want to live a life of dependency and you don't want to live a life of service, should it surprise you that you're like, why isn't the church doing more for me? Why aren't these people caring for me? My phone isn't ringing. Nobody's visiting me, reaching out to me, helping me. And I'm telling you that you will find more of your life by seeking to do the very things you long for for others. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen the terrible, tragic story that happened to the Las Vegas Raiders this week. Wide receiver Henry Ruggs III, you know, was drinking and then driving in his Corvette, went 160 miles an hour while he was drunk and plowed into the back of this innocent woman and killed her instantly. He and his passenger were also injured, but... Not fatally. He's been charged with all these felonies and the Las Vegas Raiders immediately cut him and he has, you know, a lot of charges pending against him. And it's a, it's a terrible time to say, this woman just driving along, just driving along, hit from behind by a 160 mile an hour Corvette. Can you imagine? And the star quarterback for the Raiders came out and said this, Henry Ruggs needs to be loved right now. He needs to know he has people in his corner. And if no one else will do it, I'll do it. My heart goes out so much. I'll just say with a straight face because I've already been emotional about every bit of this. To the family, to the families involved, no one ever wants to see this. Whether it's a football player or not, you never want to see something like this. It broke my wife's and I's heart, honestly. See, what he's doing, what Derek Carr, the quarterback's doing, is he's saying, this is awful for the victim. And it's awful for this wide receiver. And what do I have to do? I gotta love. I gotta tell this family, I'm so sorry. This should never happen to you. And then I gotta tell my my teammate, Henry Ruggs, I'm so sorry, it's a tragic mistake. You'll regret this the rest of your life. But notice how when he comes out, when Derek Carr, the quarterback, comes out and makes a statement, he bears some of the price too. He says, it breaks my wife's and my heart. I mean, we're as emotional about this as anybody, he says. But to say he needs love, and I gotta love, it's costly. It's costly, isn't it? Should it surprise you that to love your enemies, to love those that have hurt you, to love those you don't wanna forgive, to love the hard to love, that it's costly. 
does it surprise you that the church is hard to love? That loving each other in your community groups or on these ministry teams, in all these neighborhoods, I mean, it's costly. And he's saying that's our calling. But if that's our calling, what should be the focus of the church? You see how the calling combats our individualism, but how does the focus combat the individualism too? Notice what he says the focus of the church should be in verses 8 and 9. Verse 8, to me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He says, listen, I think it's crazy too that I'm an apostle, okay? You're not the only one that thinks this is nuts. I'm the least likely candidate for this, okay? But granted that, I got one job. I got one job to preach. That means literally to proclaim the good news. And what does he say the good news is? The unsearchable riches of Christ. You notice he doesn't say my job is to preach conservative politics, progressive politics, American late 20, early 21st century values, Wall Street, Silicon Valley values. He didn't say any of that. He says, you know what the only thing we have to preach is? Jesus. And listen, I'm the Apostle Paul, and I met the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. Like, I met him in person, and I still don't even have words to describe him. It's unsearchable, undescribable. It's beyond imagination, the riches. The riches conveys also that we're inheritors, the church is, of these riches that we get to appropriate and enjoy these riches. Whose riches? Jesus' riches. Now think about that. If it's Jesus' riches, is the focus of your Christianity on you or on him? Is the focus of your thing about the church, is it about what does Jesus want? To what is Jesus calling me? How's Jesus leading me? To where is he asking me to commit and to serve and to sacrifice? Or is it about like, you know, who's going to meet my needs this week? Who's going to come through for me? The church has one job, and it's to lift up Jesus. It's the beauty of Jesus that we see as our focus, but it's not just his beauty. Notice it's his work, verse 9. Now it's not to preach, but to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This creator God is creating a new thing. What's the new thing? This church This church, this Jew Gentile, this like undeserving, unlikely, motleyed crew, and he's saying, listen, I got to enlighten you because you're dark about that. Like, you don't understand this. First, he says, what I have to preach about is Jesus. And then what he says is I have to show them that the point of Jesus is the church. Do you notice that? I start with Jesus, the unsearchable riches, and then I finish with what Jesus does, and that's build his church. Gather these daughters, these sons, these heirs for all eternity to himself. Now that's a different message than we hear, isn't it? Because don't we kind of hear, it's like Jesus and me, and my little private relationship with Jesus, and it doesn't really have to do with anybody else, and I can watch online and listen through podcasts and stay in my house and do it when it's convenient, but it's really about me. And he's saying, no, it's about us. It's truly about we. And if you miss that, that Jesus is saving the church, and he's saving you into the church, and he's saving you by the church, and he's saving you for the church, you have missed it. And I'm suggesting modestly you're thinking like an American, like a Westerner about Christianity. It's this individualistic thing, and he's saying it is so much more than that. we got to focus on his work. And what does his work do? He assembles us with each other. And let's be honest. Those people in our community group wouldn't ordinarily be our friends. And the people we're hanging out with and the work we're doing in mercy and justice, we wouldn't ever ordinarily do that unless Jesus told us to. Unless Jesus said, this is what you're called to do. Love people. Serve people. Give your life, your resources away. Why? Because that's what I did for you. You see the focus? Again, it's not political. It's not about what's happening in culture that day. It's not about how you can improve your golf swing or your marriage or get more successful in business. It's about Jesus and what he's doing in assembling us through his blood, by his spirit, 
into a new people. And you know what? I truly don't care if it's Trinity Presbyterian Church. The great thing about Tidewater is there are so many good churches here. And I can help you find a good church that you'll like more and better. That won't be hard. But I'm telling you, you need to commit to a church. Trinity, Xfinity, whatever it is. Find a church and commit to it. And make sure it's a church that focuses on Jesus' beauty and Jesus' work. That leads you to a life of dependency and a life of sacrifice. That's what he's asking us to do. That's what he's calling us to My favorite writer at The Atlantic is certainly Caitlin Flanagan. Everything she writes is just brilliant and searing and funny and interesting. Well, she wrote an article this week called Cancer Celebrities. And Caitlin Flanagan has had two bouts of cancer herself. And she talks a lot in this article about parasocial relationships. Like we find these celebrities and we think we're friends with them. And we find these celebrities who like have cancer. She's a cancer survivor. And she's like, I'm with you, I'm rooting for you, I feel like we're friends in this. She talks about how she struggled with that more and less with others. But then she talks about how all of these celebrities, eventually they all succumb like we all will to cancer. They all do, they all will as we will too. And that's where she got a little more serious in this article and talked about the death of the Canadian comic Norm Macdonald. You know, Norm just died, and she's like, this is the first one kind of from my generation that's passing away. And she loved his comic genius. But she said, you know what he did toward the very end of his life? No one knew that he had been struggling with leukemia. She said that he sent his best friend, the comic Bob Saget, a three-word text, I love you. The same words that he had choked out when he made his final appearance on Letterman some years before. She's saying that at the end of the day, for the rich and the famous and the celebrity or her, when it all comes right down to it, all we have left is love. That's all we have. That the only thing toward the end of our lives we want to say and have said to us is, I love you. It's very singular in its focus, isn't it? It's kind of like, this is the message. This is the story. And Paul is inviting us now to not get distracted by all the different messaging, all the ways in which you wish I were more partisan and more like MAGA or more like woke, whatever. And he's saying it's Jesus. And if we can focus on Jesus, we'll love. And we'll seek to love and serve others differently. Well, if that's how we're called and that's to what we're focused, where's the power for that? I mean, this seems like a lot, doesn't it? I mean, come on. He's asking us to love like this, dependently, sacrificially, and to keep doing it, even to people we don't like and doing things we're uncomfortable with, and to serve a church that we know is hypocritical and self-righteous and judgmental and a mess. Where do we get the power to love, serve, commit to something like the church? And I think he gives us that in this text, too. In this text, you'll notice what he says is that we have a whole new witness, a witness. But notice how he calls us to witness in verse 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You being a part of the church, assembling, receiving baptism, partaking of the supper, joining in with your brothers and sisters of every tribe and race and people and group, submitting yourself together to the lordship of this one King Jesus, makes every being in heaven stand up and take notice. He's saying that the church's glory is a witness to all the angels, good and bad in heaven. Now think about that. That they're like, what is going on down there? They're saying, why would Jesus love them? And what is this grace thing? And we know the truth about them. And why such mercy? The good angels, of course, have never sinned. They don't understand grace or the need for the blood. And the bad angels just hate the church in its allegiance to, submission to Christ. 
And to everyone in the heavens, he's saying when the church gathers and the church is, when the church loves and serves and gets over itself and seeks to love the city and commit to being better workers and neighbors and friends, it makes everybody in heaven stand up and take notice. Why? Because it shows this deeply, profoundly countercultural thing. Why are they getting together? And what are they doing? It's so stupid to just take this wine and grape juice and bread. I mean, what? I mean, how could that water possibly do anything for these babies? I mean, how could singing and confessing and standing up and, I mean, come on. We're smarter than that. We believe in technology and education and science. And what he's saying is through the church, we reveal the glory, the glory of what's true, the glory of where all of history is heading, the glory of our truest humanity, the glory of what we were made to do and what we were made for, to worship. We taste it just a little on Sundays. We approximate it. We were made to worship. You know it. You're worshiping something. And here we get this chance to rehearse to enter into what we will do for all eternity, perfectly, joyfully, freely. You see the witness that we have here? It's not like telling your neighbor. It is asking us if our witness is that bold, that bold with the angels, why isn't it with our friends and neighbors? You ever thought about that? Why we're so embarrassed to talk about Jesus? But he doesn't just say our power comes from our witness, but it comes from our confidence. And this too cuts against our individualism. Verse 11, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, this church isn't some new idea. This church is, oh, Jesus is dead now and he's raised. Ooh, what should I do now? Oh, these Israelites, they've messed it all up. They didn't ever follow the Ten Commandments. How, ah, how about I start the church? Of course he's not doing that. His plan's always been to build the church, grow the church for the nations, to the nations, with an unlikely, unlovely people. But notice what he's saying. He's saying that it was according to this purpose that he has realized, past tense, once for all, he has realized it in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, what does this mean for you and me? Think about all that you've been scared about this week. Think about all that you've been sad about this week. Think about all you've been so angry about this week. Think about those things. And he's saying, okay, now hang on. Did you, in your worry, your anger, your fear, your depression, your sadness, did you ever think, huh, what does Christ Jesus the Lord think about this? What's he doing about this? How's he controlling and reigning over this? That doesn't mean you don't cry. It doesn't mean you don't gnash your teeth. But you gnash your teeth and you cry and you shake your fist with him, toward him, alongside him. Why? Because he has realized it. Christ Jesus has entered into history. And he's been this king that died for us and lived for us and has been raised for us and now he reigns for us. And this Jesus says, I got you. I got you. I got your tears. I got your tossing in the night. I got your sleeplessness. I got your worry. I got all of your anxieties. I got all your hatreds. I can handle your humanity, okay? Why? Because Jesus, as this fully human one, was also fully divine. And he's saying, I am enough for you. And we're like, I don't know that you're enough for me. You're a nice side project, and you're incidental to me, but what I really love is my career, or my family, or my comfort. What I really need is another drink, or more work, or more television and Netflix. What I really long for is escape and freedom. And he said, no can find those through me by my spirit you're witnessing to the angels you have this incredible opportunity to see confidently whose you are and notice the confidence when joined to our witness leads to privilege privilege do you notice the privilege that's laid out here verse 12 in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. He just heaps adjective upon adjective there, doesn't he? Boldness, confidence, access. Why? Because he knows that we're like, I don't know that he loves me. I don't know that he loves me this week. 
I don't know that he's really for me or interested in this. Or In fact, I, I sometimes wonder if he might be punishing me. And I wonder if he might be withdrawing some blessing for me because I didn't do what I should have done. I say, hang on. You don't ever need to think like that, Christian. Because you've been given this unfettered access to untrammeled love. Because you've been invited into the bosom of he who says, I can't love you anymore. And I promise I won't love you any less. Why? Because where we have access, Jesus was denied access. Where we have confidence and boldness to approach his throne, Jesus was cut off from the throne and the sky became like bronze to him on that cross. He cried out and the Father ignored him. Shut his ears to him. Why? So that his ears might always be attentive to you and your cries. The cross is the pivot. The cross is the inflection point where you can be confident. Yes, I have this privilege. I know I have this access. I know that I'm loved. And I know that I'm secure. Even, even when life has fallen apart. And we can't stop from crying. And we can't stop from groaning. And we don't want to pray. Then, then, being near, being loved, being a part of the church that will be with him forever, all through faith, all by grace, then it starts to mean something. Then it starts to be like, oh, this isn't about feeling better about myself. This isn't about kind of being righteous and like looking down my nose at the people that don't go to church, whatever. It's about reality. It's been a terrible week, hasn't it, for Crime and violence in Norfolk. Of course, the worst of that is what happened in Young's this past week, that terrible, terrible murder and shootings. But just a week ago, last Saturday, I'm sure that some of you saw the shooting at the 7-Eleven where Bayview and Chesapeake meet. Right across the street from that is this restaurant where this young woman, a nursing student, was just hanging out with her fiancé, her boyfriend. And this young woman, Chelsea Nupp, and her fiancé were watching the World Series, and they heard seven shots. And both she and her fiancé ran across the street toward the gunfire into the 7-Eleven parking lot, where they found a man who had been shot five times and was bleeding out. Chelsea and her fiancé didn't just run toward the gunfire. They started taking off their shirts and they used those shirts to stop the bleeding. I quote, the first thing we did was take our shirts off and apply pressure to the guy's leg wound. In order to keep him out of shock, we set him down, began to ask him questions, just trying to keep him distracted, administering first aid for several minutes until EMS came. And I thought, okay, I wouldn't have done any of that. Like I would have run away from the gunfire or down on the floor. And if I came up to someone that had been shot, bleeding, I've taken off my shirt and applied the pressure. I don't have gloves. This is really unsafe. I mean, I'm not that brave or loving or sacrificial. And this woman and her fiancé went right into the violence. And they got bloodied, saving this person's life. Of course, think about how much more bloody Jesus was to save yours. And think about how much more he loved you when he was bloodied, as he was being bloodied for you. Now think about that. Because that's what makes us love his bride. That's what makes us want to love his people. That's what makes us want to follow him in a life of sacrifice and service and forgiveness and hospitality. It's love. Let's pray together. Help us, Father. See this love. Be changed by it to know forgiveness and be moved by it. We need you, Jesus. We need you. Give us a bigger view of yourself by your spirit. Father, reveal your glory to us through the Son that we might see that we're loved and we're loved and we're loved some more. And we pray that we would be a different people as a result. For we ask all these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, this week, a uh, couple of my kids and I climbed Old Rag. Uh, you know, this wonderful treasure that Virginia has. And it was a 
you know, beautiful weather. It's the day before election day, so it's a little, probably a little more crowded than we wanted. Um, but, you know, we do this every year, uh, sometimes twice a year. And every year, I know this is going to surprise you, but it gets harder for me. And you go through that rock scramble, and I don't do a lot of upper body workouts, surprisingly. And that gets harder and harder to kind of pull my way through and shimmy my way up. And I got to the top on Monday, and I was like, mm, me, I am just glad to sit down. So, of course, what I pack every year is a peanut butter and apple butter sandwich. Same thing I eat, like most days I'm eating lunch at home. Peanut butter and apple butter is very non-perishable. And it's smushed, it's coming out of my pack, and I just kind of sat down on that top of old rag and pulled out that PB and apple butter and just crushed it. And I'm telling you, you know peanut butter and apple butter. It's not just that there's nothing special about it. It's not just that it's blasé, it's pretty bland. But on top of that mountain, it's pretty great. And after you've been hiking for a couple hours and sweat through your shirt and thought, I'm not going to be able to make it this year, it's life-giving. Isn't that what it is with this awful wafer that we take? I mean, really, isn't that what, what it is? I mean, it's like, come on, what's this doing for me? I don't know. Because we take it and we eat it and we think, how could this little thing be of any value to me? And I think the way we know it has value is by faith. <laughs> By faith. Faith's the only thing that takes this terrible tasting thing that certainly doesn't have a caloric value to it and makes it useful and meaningful and powerful to us. Now think about that. How God uses in his grace just very ordinary things, broken things, and uses them to nourish and strengthen us, kind of like the church. But if you're not a Christian today, if you know you like Jesus and you like the idea of Jesus, I'm really glad you're here. Thank you for worshiping with us. But you don't need to feel pressure. You don't need to pretend to be somebody you're not. The supper, which is broken body and shed blood, is for those that really need Jesus, that need a Savior, that know that they have no help in this life or the next without him. And you can bring your tears and your anger and you can bring it to him. And you know what he does to you? He doesn't discipline you. He loves you. He doesn't upbraid you. He feeds you. Why don't you take that cellophane and open it up? Take that little wafer out. See, on the night in which our Lord and Savior Jesus was betrayed, he took bread after giving thanks, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, and it's broken for you. Take and eat all of you in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, well, this cup, it's the cup of the new covenant in my blood. For as often as you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you proclaim my death until I come again. We're almost to Advent, where all we do is long for him to return. But until then, we drink and we're fed and we're nourished. Take and drink. So let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would give us new energy Feed us, King Jesus, by your spirit. Give us new affections and new appetites. Stir us. Stir us by your spirit that we might see just how dependent we are. And then use all that you've done for us to make us love your church and love our neighbor, serve our city, and do it sacrificially for love's sake. We pray all this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what do we do with all this good news? Well, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. If you're able, let me invite you to stand and respond by singing. Jesus, I my cross have taken All to leave and follow thee Destitute, despised, forsaken Thou from hence my all shalt be Perish every fond ambition All I've sought or hoped or known 
forget how rich is my condition. God in hell, are still my own. Let the world despise and leave me. They have left my sin. telling you it's true. You are God's beloved. As such, lift your heads, extend your hands. Here is blessing upon you. Now may the God of peace himself, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good for doing his will, working in you that which is pleasing to him throughout all ages. To him be glory now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.